Beneath the glittering chandeliers of a stately banqueting hall in Helsinki, the clink of champagne glasses accompanies the soft murmur of diplomatic small talk. It looks like yet another diplomatic reception. But behind the facade of pleasantry, these men are deadly serious. They are here to talk about the atomic bomb. Here in this conference room, representatives of the two most powerful nations on Earth opened the SALT conferences, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks. This week, ECHO examines what, if anything, the diplomats have achieved. Mankind has learned little, it seems, from his own blood-stained history and still he flounders through the mess of his own creating, pursuing the illusion that war can bring peace. Watchful and suspicious, he jealously guards the frontiers of his tribal territory. <coughs> Nations still spend billions of dollars on sophisticated armaments and put the best of their manhood in uniform. Across the world, the little wars proliferate, and men of all nations, races, colours and creeds wait to die for causes they believe in. And yet, some slim thread of reason keeps mankind suspended above the pit of self-annihilation. Fear holds man back from total war, fear of this terrifying man-made instrument of destruction. The atomic bomb has been used only twice in the history of warfare, with such appalling results that in 1946 the United States, then alone in possessing it, offered to put the atomic weapon under the control of the United Nations. We are here to make a choice between the quick and the dead. That is our business. But this first attempt at atomic control failed. The proposition was vetoed by the Soviet Union. From that time, only one year after the end of World War II, the nuclear arms race began. The finest brains and the best equipment national budgets could buy were bent on devising newer and better methods of waging atomic war. Every new weapon brought counter-weapons. Rockets capable of circling the Earth were matched by chains of radar stations capable of detecting them. With deadlock on land, the nuclear nations launched atomic submarines, nuclear-powered and nuclear-armed. The Soviet Union built bigger, more powerful rockets. The United States armed its enormous jet bombers with rocket-powered bombs. And so the deadly build-up of nuclear weapons escalated, and the two greatest nations on Earth glared suspiciously at each other across the frigid, ideological barrier of the Iron Curtain. Montana in the northern United States, a peaceful landscape, rich in wheat and producer of beef cattle for the nation. But here, deep beneath the fertile soil, one of the deadliest arsenals of nuclear power is buried far out of sight. It is one of the paradoxes of the nuclear Cold War that it is waged every second of the day in such peaceful surroundings and by men of such peaceful demeanour. These men are driving to work, work they hope they will never have to do, for they are trained to press the buttons which could unleash enough nuclear power to end the world. Such fearsome responsibility, however, is not theirs alone. Around them is mustered the strictest security. No one is trusted to go near the firing controls without stringent checking. Their work takes them into the bowels of the earth. Theirs is a quiet, soft-spoken world amid the hardware of unimaginable destruction.
During World War II, this base ferried war materials to America's Soviet allies. Now other weapons stand ready, pointed in the same direction. Across the United States, men like these go about their gruesome business in a clean and clinical world. They could be bank managers, except that their vaults contain the doubtful riches of scientific warfare. Trained to operate the most terrifying means of waging global war, these men have the job of keeping the peace by maintaining the balance of terror. Imprisoned beneath the earth, they are incapable, on their own, of releasing the power they control. Each has a separate combination for the lock on this box, the final firing button. To avoid confusion or error, their orders are tape recorded for instant reference. Meantime, their day is spent constantly checking the state, the condition, the readiness of the weapons they hope they will never have to fire. Thank you, Lord. While they sit in this electronic dungeon, the world above goes about its business and forgets them. And forgets, too, that at any given moment, it is no more than 30 minutes from oblivion, the time between the final catastrophic decision to be taken and the rockets to be launched. Temperature abnormal. Guidance at channel 6. Your head. Open circuit. Channel 7. Re-entry. Arming and fusing. Channel 7. Several thousand miles away in Moscow, the Soviet rulers control weapons every bit as awful and keep bunkers in a state of readiness equal to those facing them. Across the top of the world, two sets of weapons and two groups of men sit waiting, endlessly alert, endlessly patient, eternally hopeful that their skills will never be put to the test. But the balance between the two is delicately poised, and the consequences of tipping it are unthinkable, especially, perhaps, to the men who live on the tightrope of humanity's future. I'm glad that we have this power, and I pray that we never have to use it. As long as the deterrent is there to keep a war from starting, this means more time for us at Geneva or uh, wherever the conference tables of the world might be. The more people talk, the better they'll be able to understand each other. Geneva, the city of peace, saw the first attempts to reach agreement on the nuclear arms menace. Here, 17 nations sought unity and common purpose in limiting the spread of nuclear weapons. The negotiations were difficult and lengthy. But while the main protagonists in the Cold War still eyed each other with hostility in public, the diplomats talked in endless private session. Of the 18 nations invited to the talks, only France, a major nuclear power, steadfastly refused to take part. The talking went on almost unnoticed until 1968. Slowly, paragraph by paragraph, a treaty for the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons was hammered out and signed by the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom. It had been 22 years since the Soviet UN veto. In Vienna, where the salt talks reconvened, the Russian delegate and his American counterpart arrived to resume negotiations. The world watched with cautious optimism, for a quarter of a century of Soviet intransigence seemed finally to be melting. Whatever their first meetings in Helsinki had achieved was veiled behind communiques couched in guarded terms. But the fact that they were held at all was a step in the right direction. And at the very least, they had agreed to talk again. Ironically, the most crucial negotiations of modern times were held in the palace of a forgotten emperor. When the talks ended, the American delegate was to say that the United States would make every effort to reach agreement. The Soviet delegate would say that the Soviet Union was unswervingly pursuing a policy of peaceful cooperation. 
the salt talks now stand adjourned again until later this year. If they succeed, the world will have gained at least a breathing space. If they fail, our children may never live to forgive us.